Welcome everyone, um, thanks for joining and today we're going to be talking about global health security and its intersections or not with other forms of global governance structures looking at immigration and global health and I'm delighted to welcome two wonderful guests who are going to be reflecting on their experiences working in the field um, and the ways in which yeah they are seeing in their work um, the challenges, the politics, and looking to how we do or don't develop effective interventions in terms of responding to these issues. So um, we have with us Professor Sarah Davies and Associate Professor Claire Wenham, and I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves and, and their work briefly before we move into a conversation. Um, Sarah, over to you. Thanks so much. It's lovely to be with you today and thank you everyone for watching. My name is Sarah Davies. I'm a professor in international relations at Griffith University, which is a screenshot of our campus in the city uh, in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. And uh, my area of research is in uh, global health governance and global health diplomacy. And I also examine um, women's peace and security in conflict and post-conflict situations. Thank you. Um, Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Wenham. Um, I work at LSE in the Department of Health Policy. Uh, like Sarah, my background is in international relations, but most of my work is in kind of the policy and politics of global health security uh, from different perspectives. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can get into um, a bit of a conversation. And I would like to, to, you know, first sort of think about the ways in which um, your work is thinking about these issues of global health security. And I thought we could just start with thinking about what global health security is and whether you could perhaps draw on your, your work to kind of explore the ways in which the relationship between health security and international relations plays out in reality. And particularly thinking about this sort of disconnect about what needs to be done versus what actually happens um, at the local level. Um, Sarah, over, over to you. Uh, thank you. So uh, global public health security or global health security is defined by the World Health Organization as activities that require uh, the minimization of danger of acute public health events that endanger people and people's health across regions and boundaries, usually geographical and international boundaries. So I think behind there, you've got some assumptions, right, around uh, it needs to be an, a public health event that is um, rapid. It's not necessarily one that has been affecting large numbers of population over a long period of time. Uh, it needs to be something that is happening across, that it's affecting multiple peoples. Uh, so it can't be an event that may just, just be affecting one group of people. And so when we look at it from that sort of more critical perspective, we start to see that there are certain types of health events that are being privileged over others. And there are certain populations that are getting privileged over others and there's certain regions that are going to matter more than others and that's particularly the criticism that is often a you know sort of laying at global health security that it that that definition that's been achieved to kind of get all the states to agree that yes there is something called a public health emergency and we can all see when it's happening and we'll all agree to change our behavior and do things differently in that event that works well when it's you know and in certain situations, um, but it can create problems then because some countries, most of the time, the kind of health crises that they're dealing with are never going to reach that health security definition. Um, and so a lot of my research has been trying to understand in the Southeast Asian region, how has that been navigated? So how do they, how have these states tried to think about preparing for something like a pandemic? but making sure that that preparedness is benefiting and supporting the daily health emergencies that they're having to deal with that may not ever get to that status of being an acute public health event that, have, you know, that the World Health Organization recognizes. And so one of the areas that I was looking at was, you know, uh, 
how the region deals with endemic disease outbreaks like dengue outbreaks and how they kind of prepared for these reporting dengue outbreaks and thinking about you know dealing with their seasonal outbreaks of dengue but doing so in a way where they're trying to still prepare and build health systems to deal with a pandemic and I, I look at the politics of that the budget how the budget gets allocated for that and sometimes you know what still doesn't get done when you're having to constantly make that compromise between what others think is acute as opposed to what you think is acute. Great, thank you very much. Um, can, can I just jump in there? Oh yeah, please. So I think the thing that I would add to, I mean, I agree with everything Sarah said, but I think the other thing, particularly when you think about international relations, is that actually, you know, the, the difference between what the WHO says a definition is, which is about outbreaks which affect people and populations is I would say it's not it's that that's not the priority for most governments it's about what affects your economy the most right and like the diseases which are prioritized by nation states as what they're going to what they're going to frame as a security issue and respond to as a security issue I would argue is as much dominated by what's going to affect their travel and trade as it is what's going to affect their population health and so you see these very different prioritizations happening and you know let's think pre-covid you know you do see different diseases being prioritized which are not the greatest health burden in a particular mm -hmm. location but they're the ones that are the most damaging because you know you get this global fear and people stop um traveling or put trade restrictions or you know import bans on particular products and so it, it has this kind of trickle down effect across your economy and i, I my, my personal view is that's what motivates government but then what you see is this kind of trickle down effect right because mainly global health security has been um crafted by western policymakers right as like diseases which might affect western capitalist systems right and like it's very much been promoted and pushed by you know countries in the global north but then what you see is this trickle down effect where countries which hadn't necessarily bought into this global health security agenda aren't the kind of key architects of driving this perception start to frame things in this way because they need to be seen to be part of this club and they want to you know get in favor with donors and this is how donors are framing things so then they start to frame things as security issues as well and again it gets even more acute at the kind of um at the level of countries which have so many endemic diseases which are then deprioritized in favor of things which the west perceive to be threats and, you know, we see this really acutely. Um, a lot of my work's been on Zika in Brazil. And in Brazil, you know, Brazil was very um, uh, against the framing of global health security. And, you know, when it was first being introduced at the World Health Organization and the World Health Assembly, and these securitized language were coming out, Brazil was one of the governments that was like, no, these are not security issues. We should not be talking about security issues. And then over the course of a decade, and, given, and also driven by political, you know, priorities as well of, of the government beyond health, we see them start to frame things like a security issue, right? And Zika was framed as a security issue because that's what Western governments thought it was. And actually it wasn't, it, it still doesn't remain the biggest health threat in Brazil, right? Like there's so many more acute things which need to be handled, which don't get handled because people in Europe and the US think Zika's a threat. And so you kind of see from an international relations perspective, you can see this kind of power dynamic around what's getting prioritized and what is perceived to be a threat and how that then affects the policy pathways and the response we see of governments who don't might not even see it or perceive it in the same way. I don't know that. Can I jump in? Sorry. <laughs> because I think I think you're absolutely right. But then for me, that's where regions matter, I think, because like in Southeast Asia, they'd gone through SARS and economically it was they were at a point where they were starting a lot of those countries was trying to manage this low low income to middle income jump and they were really worried actually that if they didn't start to address if they weren't seen to be addressing this for their own regional security to in order to facilitate the type of visa systems and trade systems that they were as region were wanting to try and achieve to grow their economies there was this real sense that they had to be collectively working to achieve this and so for them it was trying to think about because that 
managing that was crucial for the economic growth that they wanted to have and overcoming the types of other endemic health problems that they had. Mm. So it was sort of a two pronged strategy, I think, in that context. So, and for them, one of the things that I sort of found was that there was a degree of comfort with health security because it meant that health was getting access to budget and was getting access to executive level kind of decision making in a way that they hadn't before. Um, and, and so it was, so that, I think that's interesting too, Claire, that we can kind of see different regional positions on this emerging as well. So I know there definitely was a West agenda and I definitely agree with that. But I also, for me, what was interesting in Southeast Asia was you actually had some countries quite part of that push and part of that argument and very insistent on it as well, where they disagreed, which is, you're right, which is what's endemic and does endemic get to be in the agenda as well. Uh, and I think uh, in Southeast Asia, some of them push quite hard that, that endemic diseases need to be part of, of their building capacity, which not everyone agreed with, including but, but, in who. But I think the problem though, and certainly the problem that we saw in, in Brazil was that securitizing a disease leads to a particular, a particular response, right? It's about short-term, get in, get rid of that virus, stop it, mm -hmm. use whatever you can throw at it. You know, we're seeing it play out with COVID, right? It's about, you know, well, we haven't seen lockdowns before, but bringing in measures to stop this now, border control and, um, you know, fumigation in the case of, of Zika, right? And that's not addressing the underlying issues which lead to endemic disease, right? It's not looking to change the access to, um, you know, healthcare or access to water sanitation, um, and hygiene and all the things that we know promote other forms of disease developing it doesn't do anything to stop that so actually you know I see a tension between the way that responses happen to securitized diseases and tackling endemic disease because it's just not necessarily the same response. So <clears throat> you mentioned Claire and I wonder if either of you want to comment on this the sort of border closures right coming in as something that might assist or might not assist in um, addressing these sort of issues that are considered to be of global concern and the sort of panic that comes from some spaces versus endemicity elsewhere and, and so on. And I was just wondering, you know, from, from my side, one of the interests I have is about the disconnect that we often see between sort of global health security, I suppose international health diplomacy, um, immigration governance, and then the sort of wider global health field. Um, and I just wondered if either of you had anything to sort of comment on and how you've seen that perhaps play out in your own work. Um, and one of the things I was thinking, Claire, you've written, you know, about sort of the, the linkages around universal healthcare coverage and sort of again, how that plays out. And are we seeing global health security as something that can contribute to achieving universal healthcare coverage? Are we seeing it as something that actually is negatively affecting some of those approaches? Um, so yeah, I just wondered if either of you had any reflections around those sorts of tensions. I mean, so this is not my area of expertise, but one thing I do think is interesting is this question of borders, right? And I think it's become a particularly acute during COVID, but it's not new, right? Shutting borders or, or not allowing people to pass borders because of their health status is, is old, right? We've seen it with HIV, right? You know, some countries don't let you in if, you, if, you've got, if you're HIV positive, for example. Um, but the way governments then respond to um, migrant communities is really different, right? So for example, on the Thailand Myanmar border, and Sarah probably knows way more about that than I do, you have um, you know, a lot of migrants coming over. And for a long time, the Thai government basically, you know, almost framed them as, as the kind of health risk, right? And they were the ones bringing disease into the country. But now that what they but that and so and that, that they weren't entitled to access to healthcare and they weren't entitled to, you know, all the um, the provisions of universal health care that the Thailand offer. But now they've sort of changed their policy and they recognize that actually that's the way of if you if you target that population with health provision, you are able to manage diseases in your country more, right? Like support them, provide them with the care they need. They're then less likely to spread the disease across the Thai population. So you see this kind of shift in policy. And I think 
I mean, somewhere where I know more about it is kind of the Venezuela-Colombia border, where you're seeing exactly the same thing, and loads mm -hmm. of migrants coming over, many of whom you know, haven't had any access to healthcare for years because the system's completely collapsed. And the Colombian system has always basically given free provision to anyone, right? So they've had a massive burden on their health system since it's happened, since, since the, the crisis has started to happen. We're seeing loads of um, new diseases be reintroduced to Colombia that hadn't been seen in um, Colombia for many years, you know, uh, malaria, polio even, they have a case of polio. Mm. Um, and so they're trying to kind of, again, combat that with a universal health coverage response. But what's interesting is the perception, right? The perception then is that migrants are the ones who are infected, right? And they're the ones coming in our community and bringing disease. And that has led to a lot of distrust of migrant populations. And it mm. kind of links this kind of the way that they've come across and the way that their health system has collapsed has this sort of knock on effect then on integration sort of within society. Um, and so I think it's a much bigger problem that I am definitely not qualified to talk about. But certainly there's that kind of challenge between how governments frame it and then how it's perceived as well. Thanks. Um, Sarah, anything from, from your side? I think, again, what's been interesting to see has been the debate around um, what, what stateless persons and, and mm. asylum seekers, what type of care that they are and healthcare they're entitled to. And to me, it's really interesting that before the onset of COVID-19, there had been sort of, you know, Lance and Commission and there'd been discussions around this. There was starting to, this awareness was starting to, to filter through that there was, you know, we've had protracted refugee situations, you know, some of the largest movements of refugees since World War II. Uh, and we've also got a high number of stateless persons. And, and what's happening is, you know, that they're, they're, they're sort of falling in the gaps in terms of their quality of healthcare. So I think there'd been a conversation around how there can be accommodation and what kind of financing arrangements could be introduced mm. to try and address this that had been happening before COVID-19. So for me, what was really interesting was to see the, the rapidness with which particularly the stateless uh, civil society networks and advocates really quickly came together uh, at the onset of COVID-19 and started to talk very quickly actually about vaccine access and how mm. this was going to work. Mm. Um, and again, you know, I've been kind of watching in, in this region, particularly in Indonesia and Malaysia, a lot of discussions about how you could make sure that, you know, in, in Bangladesh, populations were not neglected from vaccine access. And I think right now there's the conversation, yes, about making sure that they're not identified as security threats. Uh, on the other hand, though, there's also been the conversation about it's this out uh, this the, th the perception of COVID-19 itself as a threat has mobilized types of response that it's taken some places years to, to get going, which is, you know, health registration cards, et cetera. But one of the sort of blow on effects of that now is trying to support populations to feel safe to come forward and to get their cards and to get registered because while there's definitely a need for people to access the vaccine, there's also a lot of wariness and concern about if they present themselves, what's going to happen next? You know, they get their vaccine and then are they then going to be, you know, rounded up in two months time, you know, for, for, for a, a stop and check measure where they may, then may be identified as being an illegal migrant. And so I think that's where that background of human rights and health always needs to be present and being discussed. Mm. And that for me is one of the concerns in any kind of securitization of health. Mm. We're not talking about the human rights dimensions mm. and political liberties in this conversation, then we're missing so much about what drives behavior. Mm. Absolutely. And I mean, we're seeing that play out here in, in interesting ways. And, you know, you know, it really is, I think globally, we know that health is political, but I think that for, you know, for some people who, you know, haven't engaged with the ways in which health is governed and the politics of health, I think have been surprised and shocked at the role that like politicians play, at the role that um, our governments play in positioning and framing and the decisions that they're making and the way they're justifying these. Um, you know, and we're definitely seeing this shift back. I mean, Claire, you mentioned the way that, you know, historically borders and, and health status have gone together. And I mean, 
since forever this idea of kind of containment and keeping people out and the language of othering versus the language of sort of deservingness and, and rights, Sarah, as you, were, as you were mentioning. But I think it is really, you know, playing out in real time at the moment, and we've seen it before, but the ways in which the intersection of, you know, these political challenges around managing health, around global health security, around immigration, the role of the nation state, a return to, you know, more nationalistic, racist, xenophobic sort of conditions and how the the current moment and you know how in in other points in time this kind of keeping people out you know um as you as you mentioned sort of hiv status being used to filter people out so health being used as this kind of fil filtering mechanism of who's allowed to belong and who isn't and whilst you know there's been sort of two decades of work in trying to address that we know that this still exists. We know that sort of asylum seekers or refugees who are part of relocation programs, for example, some countries are still using HIV status, even though they don't formally say we won't allow this individual in, they're using it as a way again to, to pressure and, and filter. So I think, you know, from this is, is also just thinking about different ways that um, we should be thinking about um, global health governance, we should be thinking about health diplomacy, international relations. And Claire, I know that you've got this new book, which I'm excited to engage with, um, looking at feminist global health security. Um, and both of you were recently involved in, in writing about sort of the role and the importance of thinking about a feminist political analysis to COVID, really looking at how this is kind of more than a public health crisis. And I just wondered if you could you could reflect on what the importance and what role a feminist global health security, a feminist political analysis can bring to our understanding of the ways in which global health can kind of play out in this interconnected transnational world. Um, and I think that this is, this is important for, you know, various reasons that I'm hoping you're going to unpack about the way we approach the research, the way that gender is being framed or not, who's doing the work, and who the work is engaging with. Um, so yeah, Claire, I wondered if you wanted to start us off just with some reflections, particularly around your, your book, that would be great to, to hear some more about. Sure, so um, I mean, I guess it goes back to what Sarah started with, which is, you know, when you securitize a disease, the policies that we see to respond to it protect certain people more than others, right? And you can look at this at the macro level that it's protecting, you know, Western states and Western populations and economies. But even when you look at it at the population level, the kind of the gender neutral approach to it, as if everybody experiences disease in the same way, is kind of missing, right? It's all about epidemiological case numbers, as if each one of those people are exactly the same. And, um, you know, what, what I try and show through this book is that basically, you know, women experience it. Women experience the response to health emergencies very differently to men. Not only are women more likely to be infected, because of the ways that they are, you know, primary caregivers, they're more likely to be exposed to the disease, they're working on the front line, they're more likely to be in contact with the disease. But then the, all the secondary effects that we see across epidemics are more likely to be borne by women. So they're more likely to be the ones who lose their job because they're taking time to care for someone who's sick, or as we've seen during COVID, because lockdowns come in and they're more likely to be working in sectors that are more, um, you know, affected by uh, stay at home orders because you can't work in retail or in hospitality or tourism. Um, and then they're more likely to be the ones who take time out to be the caregiver, right? So you're so, and, or in the case of COVID, do the homeschooling and be at home with the kids. And so you see this kind of your most in, your women are most infected, but also most affected because they then have the knock on effects of these. Well, I say short term, but we're in year two of COVID, so less short term. Um, and so it's more thinking about, well, how do we try and mitigate against women basically bear, bearing the burden and absorbing the labour associated with implementing the policies that governments bring in to um, prevent or contain diseases? Um, and if you sort of look at it from a feminist perspective, you know, all these things are really obvious, right? It's going to be not only women who bear the brunt of it, but particularly, uh, you know, the poorest, rural, blackest women around the world, because we know of, all, of all, everything we know about intersectionality and, 
and structural racism and structural inequalities in society, it's going to be the kind of most marginalized groups in society who bear the burden both ways, right? And so how do we try and combat that through policies which directly respond to those people? How do we craft policies which actually support the people who need the most support rather than supporting a, 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 a you know, unnamed unisex um, uh, case number, right? Which actually isn't the person who's experiencing the most. And so we see this complete disconnect. And then, you know, you can unpack it one step further about the kind of further knock-on effects, right? Who's able to access services? Who's able to access care? In the case of Brazil, it was around who's able to access, and during Zika, it was about who's able to access reproductive health services, you know? And that, again, is determined by kind of, you know, where you live and who you are and how much money you have. And, you know, we see these all kind of bearing out. And what I could try and show is that by taking a feminist perspective, you end up with very different policy implement policy goals, right? It's not about ending this disease the quickest way possible and then moving on with your life, which is a kind of traditional security re response. It's about how do we improve the structures that prevent people from getting disease in the first place? How do we recognize all the inequalities across access to healthcare so that women aren't going to be the ones who are most disadvantaged? And how do we try and kind of, you know, ask that question of kind of where are the women, how are they being affected, and then write policy that supports them rather than by default writing policy which supports the kind of white male in Geneva who writes that policy in the first place. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Sarah, anything that you'd like to add into, into this? Probably the only thing I'd add to that is that one of the things that we looked at in the paper then is then, you know, if you think about who designs the recommendations and who provides with states that kind of evidence-based understanding of how to respond to outbreak events and health emergencies, most states turn to or at least look at the advice that's being issued by the World Health Organization. And in that article, we were sort of looking at that has sort of two problems with it. The first one is that this perception that if you add women to your committee, or if you add women to your, to your document, your job is done then in terms of gender analysis. And one of the things that we argue in the article is that adding women, while important, it's important that there's representation and there should be representation beyond uh, sex, uh, but that then can sometimes not necessarily address the problem here, which comes back to Claire's point. If the assumption in public health is that this space is gender neutral, then women working in health as much as men can unintentionally contribute to then perpetuating this problem, which is that they may not necessarily see, depending on the position that they've come from, what it's like to be low income, stateless individual trying to navigate a pandemic. It's a very a different type of lived experience to one that you may have if you're not, if you've never had that experience before. And so one of the areas that we talk about then is it's not just about representation of, of sex, it's about representation of experience. And so the World Health Organization, like most UN organizations, are not really set up to accommodate that multiple experience, diverse experience into its into its committees and into its hearings. And, and it needs to, it really needs to think about how to make sure that there is different voices from being presented in something like a public health emergency committee. Not because necessarily that representation should uh, be written into the way they manage their work, but there needs to be hearing those experiences, particularly those local experiences that may affect the way in which they think about what is a public health emergency and how different populations are affected. And then the second thing that we talk about in that article is the, the need then also to think about gender inclusion as being much broader than uh, thinking about uh, women uh, as, as being participants in health emergencies, but also being recipients of care in health emergencies, that they can be there can be a diversity of roles here and there can also be sometimes um, some very serious gender inequality dynamics going on in environments which affect a cross section of populations being able to access information during health emergencies and make choices in health emergencies. And, and so one of the things that we make in this article is that it's really important to talk about counting women and making sure that women are, are heard 
but it's also really important to think about who else needs to be heard. And then when designing um, advice and recommendations and prevention programs in particular, uh, there needs to be this understanding of uh, gender can affect the way information is delivered, received and the roles that people take on in terms of delivering information. And we've seen this with COVID-19, you mm -hmm. know, that you've had a diversity of, of approaches here and some of them have been uh, very, uh, you know, uh, masculinist in their kind of orientation and the way in which there's kind of been this association of who can go out and get the food and who can go out and do the work and who needs to stay home and do the care but also, you know, how decisions are made around accessing who gets, you know, the testing, whether or not it's safe to go and get tested, if it's safe to go and get a vaccine, um, affordability, all these sorts of issues also come to the fore as well. And, and I think kind of going back full circle to where we started with about kind of how this is all linked to international relations is that, you know, we can, you can see all these impacts that happen, the gendered effects, gendered impacts, you can see how you know you need to look at diversity of experience and try and bring that in but the fundamental problem with the way the system is set up is it's a state-based system right and so it's states making the decisions and states are making the decisions about how they respond but even in things like the who and other multilateral organizations it's still state-based membership so you know health security is a very state-based uh, approach to policy making and that it's, it's, it's almost a tension then between kind of state policy making, which recognizes states as the thing which is going to be affected, and they need to respond at that level, and then a kind of a feminist approach where it's all about looking at the individuals and actually kind of different societal effects on different groups. And so these are kind of inherently intended intention, I would argue. And somehow, and again, it, you know, this is similar to the kind of human rights arguments that we saw around securitization of health during HIV, but there's this kind of disconnect between who's being affected and how, and who's making the policy and how. And, you know, it's not an easy solution. And I don't think there's been any, well, maybe Sarah, you can think of something, but, you know, any successful attempt to actually marry these up, which has actually worked. Uh, and that's a fundamental flaw with kind of health security. Mm. And I think we see this sort of play out, you know, obviously around other pieces of the, the sort of global health governance spaces. But I think it, it is that global health security, you know, from, you know, it's not my area of specialism at all. Um, but what, you know, I've been seeing around these sorts of disconnects, I guess, with this kind of immigration governance, health governance and broader imperatives around that is that we have seen gender being discussed but we know it's often a tick box right and it is as you as you sort of say it's not simply about saying oh you must it's about rethinking how you know policy formulation as you as you've outlined sort of is is thought about and and is implemented just before we we I end I, 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 yes no, please because one, one of the reasons why i think it's really important to to address it too is because what we've seen also with COVID 19 is this kind of but the, how did the women leaders do? How did the women leaders do in responding to COVID-19? And that really worries me because we're doing two things then. We're kind of essentializing again, you know, we're sort of saying that biology determines actions and, and that's far from the truth. We're also saying that the only way in which women can kind of be leaders in this space is by being caring, sharing, empathetic. And, and that kind of lets men off the hook, to be blunt, um, as if they don't need to embody those kind of those qualities either. And it also too is just not where we want to be in the health in this in this space. We want to be actually thinking about what makes good leadership, what makes inclusive health protection, what makes inclusive healthcare delivery and design. And it's really problematic if we start to say or start to presume that only certain people can do that because of their sex. That's not where we want to be uh, in this space. Um, whether we're relying on a state leader or civil society, everyone needs to be engaged in this in this area. And, and that's one of the things that's been worrying me as well as we, um, we don't want it to be seen as something. Have we got a woman here? Tick, is she going to be talking about, you know, communication of our program to to the civil society actors tick okay our job is done um that, that's not where we want to be in this space that's not progress um and i suppose you know whilst we could have like you know whole courses on many of these issues 
I'm just going to throw in a, a sort of last question just to maybe think about how we can we can wrap this up and it is about both of you have written about the tensions around you know the um, international health regulations and the opportunities they perhaps present um, the opportunities they don't present you know there's been calls particularly in places like Europe around needing these new manifestos around a, a sort of global health security response and yet we have some tools so I suppose my my final question is why is it the tools that we have aren't working? Is it that they're no longer relevant? Is it that they are missing a lot of this nuance that we've been discussing around the need to actually engage at the local level with lived experiences? Um, is it, or is it simply that it's, it's that today in the context of COVID-19, the world and many nation states who previously haven't had to really think about these issues are actually so far behind in engaging with the field of global health security in the context of international relations, in terms of global health diplomacy, um, that they're missing some of the tools we already have. So I just thought as a, as a wrap up, maybe I could ask you, um, you know, I know it's big questions and lots that could be discussed, but just to sort of wrap up around that and what you think is the way forward. What do you think we need to be doing next um, to try and address some of these, these tensions? Big question. Um, I'm going to jump in. So I think that, you know, these the things like the international health regulations, I don't think they are um, out of date. I don't think they're fundamentally flawed. I think they are the best public health. You know, they, 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 they try and cover public health measures. And I don't think we necessarily need to change them. The problem is that people don't listen to them, right? So the problem isn't the mechanism, it's the compliance with them. And that to me has been the biggest failure that we've seen during COVID is that you have this, you know, you have these regulations which are based on public health evidence, they're based on following the best, you know, uh, public health approach to it. And the governments who basically have just said, yeah, no thanks, right? We're gonna do it our way. And so I think what needs to happen is we need to basically understand why governments don't do that and governments don't do that because there's no incentive to do that there's no you know if you're a big western government your incentive is to get your electorate happy right and do whatever that is rather than comply with global health security and supporting other populations around the world now from a public health perspective you can argue that's really short-sighted because any disease anywhere in the world is going to be a risk right right now only vaccinating your own population and not committed to vaccine equity is a long-term threat because more variants will develop that's going to put your vaccination program at risk but governments don't think like that they think i need to win an election people aren't going to support me if i'm vaccinating people halfway around the world they want all the vaccines in their arms and in their families and so there's no incentive for complying with global health security norms and law so i think what we need to do is really figure out basically how do we change that right that's the fundamental thing mm. how do we get governments to comply with this best public health practice and there have been talks like you mentioned of like bringing a pandemic treaty and kind of getting everyone together and signing on the dotted line that we're all going to do better next time but i think it's really naive to think it's going to be any different because unless you have um uh, financial incentives for example for reporting or sharing or sanctions for not doing something Government's is going to do exactly the same again. And you can get Boris Johnson and Joe Biden saying, yes, we're committed to global health security and solidarity and equity. But it's going to happen again, right? It's going to happen exactly the same way because of the political and economic incentives, which mm -hmm. just, just aren't there. And I don't think now anyone, any government is going to agree to a pandemic treaty which has sanctions. It's not politically feasible, right? No one's going to say, yeah, sure, you know whack some economic sanctions on me if I don't report a disease. So I think it's going to be, you know, I, I unfortunately think that's kind of the system's wrong and the structure's wrong. And that until we get over those big things about why do governments comply with international norms and law, which is obviously a massive issue across international relations, we're, we're going to be in the same position. Mm -hmm. And we're going to waste a lot of time and money drafting a treaty to not really have any impact. Mm. Thanks, Sa Sarah. I think it would be more useful for us to sit back and actually look at what parts of the international health regulations have been adhered to. And I think if we sit back and look at them over, a, over the 15 odd years, there are some components of the international health regulations that I would argue even at its 
higher stress point, there has been some behavioral shift amongst most states. So there are even China in the case of COVID-19, there was about a five to eight day gap there where it really wasn't telling anyone what was going on. But it did eventually come forward with some information because of the, the fact that the disease had gone by that point and they needed to regain the, the situation. Otherwise it was going to be completely out of their hands, not just internationally, but at home. Um, you know, and I think we've always got to remember countries are also worried about how things look at home as well, as Claire said. So I think that there are some parts of the way in which that regulation is set up, the way in which the World Health Organization, even at its lowest point last year when Trump was really lambasting it, there was still this sort of gaze to what World Health Organization was saying in terms of the rate of spread. What were they saying in terms of whether or not this the strain was in fact needed to be identified and talked about as a strain, um, as a variant. So, so there's some components of their role there that is, it seems to, there seems to be a general kind of consensus. As Claire said, what you had though is massive variations in states performance and the way in which they took parts of it seriously, they didn't. And that comes back to, again, the, you know, the practices and the internal dynamics of states. And I think it's a little bit um, wishful thinking to think that you could perhaps just through a treaty, get rid of any of those. Uh, I think for me, what's been really interesting, the one comment I've heard in all the conversation that's been said about this was Helen Clark, who was one of the co-chairs of the independent panel on the pandemic response said recently in a webinar, that she thinks one of the biggest flaws of the international health regulations was the trade and travel measure. She thought that that was, I don't want to misquote her, but she was basically like that was that was a little bit of um, just sort of unrealistic thinking by those in 2005 who thought that you could ever tell states what to do in that space. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's been really interesting because one of the things that I think it's hard actually for a lot of people in the first six months of COVID-19 was to actually see that the one lesson that was being learned very quickly was that you shut your borders, <laughs> um, you know, and, and despite all the impacts that that had. And I think perhaps that, that actually did a lot of damage in hindsight now mm -hmm. to the international health regulations, because then it started to make people not just question the, not just question that, that article, but questioned then the entire regulations itself. If they could have something like that in there, why on earth should we listen to anything else? And so I think then this pandemic treaty conversation is just actually, rather than us going back and saying, how can we make the regulations better? Everyone now is saying, well, we need something else. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think, you know, and it's always the lure of something else, something new and shiny and glossy, but I think I agree with everything Claire said. It's mm -hmm. Why would that work? Why would that overcome? You'll design a treaty to respond to COVID-19, which won't respond to whatever will come up next. Um, I think, you know, Joe, you said at the beginning, we have something here already. We could just make it better, but that doesn't necessarily sound great, does it, for states? We're just going to retool what we've got. Um, that doesn't sound glamorous and exciting. Thanks, because I think, yeah, just, just as we end, I mean, it really is again, this reminder for perhaps people who haven't engaged in the field of, of sort of health and the politics of health and global health and governance, you know, people working in the sector who've been looking at these processes are very aware that health is political, right? And politics is about how health manifests, whether we're thinking about structural determinants um, at the local level, whether we're thinking about bigger politics, um, and who's making those decisions. And it really is, I think, a time that many have, you know, had to had to sort of recognize this. And as we've seen more people become involved in, you know, pandemic responding, who perhaps haven't got the skill set, who haven't got that insight into the skills that international relations and the field of like health security, people working in political sciences more broadly, social sciences, who've been working on many of these issues around the dynamics of governance and, and responses have been sidelined in many ways. 
Um, and as you say, the risk is this sort of, right, we need to, you know, come at this from a new angle, people who haven't been working and aren't listening and aren't learning from previous experiences and knowledge and, and the ways in which politics plays out in these spaces are just going to want to then have like a three year commission looking to come out with a, you know, evaluating the response to COVID, the, the why we need a new pandemic preparedness plan and so forth. And not only is that frustrating and a waste of money and a waste of time and a waste of effort, it again comes back to whose voices are being sidelined. And I think, I think it is interesting to look at, you know, and people are doing this, and I know that much of the work that has been happening around the COVID and gender project and initiatives is, is this issue of who's being listened to. And I, I think we are again seeing the, you know, the white man in Geneva becoming the authority, whilst there are many who are far better qualified um, but I think it's many women. I think it's people working outside of these large international organizations who have done much more of their kind of, you know, feet on the ground and how we find ways to bring those experiences in. And I think that the work you're both doing about emphasizing the importance of um, feminist approaches to these issues um, will hopefully be contributing to some of those people who do have a seat at the table in pushing them to be the people who can push some of these agendas. But we know how hard this is and how long it is and pandemics are going nowhere. Um, and what does pandemic preparedness mean moving forward? And yeah, in the field of migration and health, we knew long before COVID that pandemic preparedness didn't engage with migrant communities, transnational movement in effective ways, which is ironic given a pandemic is about exactly those issues. Um, so again, how do we how do we bring that in? And I think that that's where we need the new thinking, the thinking that that comes from what's come before, and we continue to build on the knowledge we have. But we know politics is not driven, political agendas are not evidence informed, and so this is going to be the constant battle. So I guess on a very depressing note to end, <laughs> uh, I want to thank you both so very much. Um, and look forward to future engagements and to engaging with your work um, as we as we move forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.